on Animal ER. A team of Houston's top veterinarians treat a white tiger in crisis for the first time. But during their daring surgery, they got a little bleeding. Life-threatening complications set in. The tiger's oxygenation status started to go down. And a special companion for an ailing child. They fell in love instantly. Requires urgent intervention. This is the kind of case that can go south very quickly. While a beloved lab needs a delicate surgery to save her life. It's not getting better if we don't do something. It's animal medicine. I don't hear it. I can't find a heart. At a whole new level. There's almost nothing we can't do at Gulf Coast. Thank you so much for being here, guys. Congratulations on this show. Thank you. I got a chance to see the first episode. It is incredible. We're going to talk about it in a second. Uh, but first, I wanted to say thank you, because I know you guys have been in this game for a while, even though the show's brand new. You've both have been doing this for a long time. If you had to put just a ballpark number on it, uh, how many lives do you think you guys have saved in, in, in your career? Tens of thousands? Hundreds of thousands? How many thousands? Because I was blown away by just the four or five that I saw in one episode of television. So, so ballpark number. Megan, what do you think? How well, many? I, I would say probably 10, 15,000 lives saved. Now, we see over 50,000 cases a year. Unbelievable. And I've been doing it for 25 years now. So that's, yeah, that's a lot of lives. Staggering. Round of applause for that. For just real quick, process that number. That's amazing. So thank you for that. Um, and I want to know first, as I said, you've been doing this for a while. What was that first moment in your life that you knew, this is what I'm here to do? And we can start with you, Danielle, and we'll go to Dr. Brian in a second. For me, you know, I, I think I was just born a little bit weird. <laughs> you know, I was always that, like, Dennis the Menace kid, kind of. Like, I had a wagon full of bugs that I would tote around, and, and I was always carrying snakes and buckets and catching frogs, and, you know, so, so that's, that's always been me. How early did that start, that you were carrying around snakes and buckets of frogs? <laughs> As soon as I could walk, like as soon as I could ambulate as as you were fast enough to catch them, then then they were mine. That's pretty. That's pretty cool. And, and Dr. Brian, how about yourself? You know, it started very early. You know how when you're a kid, you like to go up and, and spend the, the night at your grandparents. I used to do that, and they were huge animal lovers, and they had Saint Bernards and mastiffs. I was covered with slobber my entire life, and <laughs> you know they they would go to great extremes to take care of their pets. They drive all the way from Alexandria, Virginia, all the way up to the University of Pennsylvania to, to get their tr pets treated properly. So that really had a big influence on mine. That's pretty incredible. And how long have you guys been now over at uh, the Houston Gulf over there, the, the place where the show takes place? Have you been there for a long time? Yeah, yeah I've been there for Actually, in four days, it'll be uh, 25 years wow. now. You applaud for so, 25 years yeah. in anything, much so, less this. Yeah, That's yeah. incredible. Gulf Coast Veterinary Specialist started in 1988, yeah. and we have over 250 doctors and staff. Wow. And uh, it's an amazing place, and I think you're going to just see you know, the, the cutting-edge care, state-of-the-art type of technology. Uh, and, and we see patients of every size and species on this for in sure. our in our practice. For sure. And Danielle, how long have you uh, been? I've been there for eight years, uh -huh. um, specifically with with avian and exotics. I don't do the dog and cat stuff. Right, um, right. But but yeah, I mean, it's you know we we do wonderful work. I'm really proud of what we're able to do and and the service that we're able to offer. For sure. Well, as I said, I just I got to see the first episode, and it is incredible. Uh, and we only see so many stories there. Why now? Why so long to get this incredible show on the air? What, what, what are we waiting for? This is, this is you know, <laughs> you just got to meet the right wondered, person. Right? You yeah. know? <laughs> and uh, it, it, you know, it took us a long time to build up our expertise and our caseload. And, uh, you know, we started out with a lot of dogs and cats and then we started to expand. And now mm -hmm. we're doing exotic animals and zoo animals, uh, but still a lot of dogs and cats. Yeah, well, one of the things that's uh, great about the, the show is you get a sense of that, all the different areas uh, of the facility and, and how many different species you guys work with. There's a, a great line years ago I don't know if, uh, from Seinfeld where Kramer refuses to see a, do a human doctor. He wants to see a vet because they got to see a cow, a chicken, a pig, a horse, all in the same day. And that always stuck with me because he makes an incredible point. How do, you, how do you start to expand? How do you prepare? How do you cover so many species in something like that? How do you make sure you're adequately prepared for whatever comes through that door? Because anything can come through that door. Build a great team, I think, yeah. is the, the big yeah. thing. You know, I mean, we, we have so many specialists, and, and um, you know, sometimes that, that 
can lead to a little bit of, of niche expertise, but that's a, a great thing is, you know, we have so many people who are amazing at what they do and just, I think, together it forms yeah. a fantastic team. Yeah, we have a lot of people who are at the top of their fields, and so they're always trying to progress. We work a lot with the human specialist as well, mm -hmm. so we collaborate a lot. Houston's a huge medical center, and so we, we work with doctors of all different disciplines, and that helps us develop our discipline and our, our, our practice of medicine. For sure. Uh, one, of the, one of the incredible stats that I read about you, sir, was that you will conduct between 10 and 20 surgeries a day, uh, which is unbelievable. We'll do like six of these shows, and I go home feeling <laughs> beat. How, what do you do at the end of the day to recharge your batteries and, and get yourself prepared to go back in there and you know, do it all over again? It's, it's, it's amazing. I always say I've never worked a day in my life. Right. Because at Gulf Coast, it's fun, and it, it's not really work. And the day flies by, and we've got such an incredible team of technicians who are like nurses, and they are so efficient at getting the patient anesthetized and getting them into surgery, so we can really roll through and get a lot of animals taken care of very quickly. It's pretty incredible. Um, I think I know the answer to the second half of this question, but I'm going to start. Uh, indulge me, if you will. Smallest animal or patient you've ever worked with? That would be her. <laughs> <laughs> Not me specifically. I'm fairly large for one of our patients. <laughs> no, I didn't work on her. <laughs> um, no, you know, we see like neonate little hatchling turtles that are like the size of a quarter. Um, we see teeny tiny little toads and frogs. Um, we'll see tarantulas occasionally or scorpions. Um, little snakes that are like five grams, you know, like a handful of paper clips. Um, so teeny, teeny, tiny patients. D dumb question. At that point, how do you work on something so minuscule? Is it just a matter of really specialized tools? Are you using a lot of magnifying glasses you know, and bright lights? Like, what's going on in there? Like, so how? It sort of, it depends on, on the individual animals or patient's problem. Yeah. You know, if we're doing surgery and something like that, sometimes that that is a physical impossibility. Right. Um, but yes, absolutely. There's loops, there's magnifiers, um, there are, are lights, there are microsurgical tools. Um, you know, we've all got pretty nimble fingers. Uh, yeah. It's all ladies in the exotics department, so that, that helps with our, our tiny hands. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, I think it's a combination. Yeah, and a lot of the things we're doing now are minimally invasive. And uh -huh. so that involves using a scope, which is like a microscope. So something this big actually looks that big on the, right. on the screen. Do you have to retrain uh, any of your skills at that point to sort of adjust for that scale, or does it actually become easier because it's so much larger now? There's or? definitely a learning curve. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, you know, you're looking up here, and you're operating down here. Right, so right. You have to Think learn that eye hand. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah the, the kids of today are going to be amazing surgeons. Yeah. Awesome, yeah. very, very cool. So my follow-up question to the tiniest is what was the largest? And I, and I think, w w am I incorrect that maybe it's in the first episode, or is that not the largest? Uh, well, the one first of the, maybe episode, we are doing surgery. We're operating on a white Bengal tiger. Unbelievable. Uh, about 300 pounds, but um, Give that's not... Give or take. <laughs> <laughs> about, yeah. uh, certainly the, uh, the, the one that had the best growl that I've ever worked on. Oh, my God, it's but, uh, so intense. Um, I want to talk in great length about this experience because it's a big part of the episode and it blew my mind. But we do have a clip just to give everybody some context of what, what you guys were working with. If we could run that, that'd be awesome. When I hear big cat surgery, there's a couple things that come into my mind. And one is keeping the cat asleep. So we've brought in an exotic animal specialist to handle the anesthetic and also the pain management of this big cat. Need to be either on that side or she's gonna need to be on this side. Is the back open? Yes, sir. All right. Nia's in an agitated state. They do not want her to attack the cage and injure herself or the people around her. Hi, baby. One second. One second. Oh my God, amazing, right guys? Isn't that incredible? So, so walk me through just the beginning of that. They said to you, hey, uh, don't freak out. 
but we've got a white Bengal tiger we need you to operate on. What's your, what's your immediate reaction? Because have you ever operated on a tiger before like that, or have you ever worked? Oh, uh, yes, but usually we do this in the zoo facility. So, right. So we, we do a lot of stuff with the Houston Zoo, but this particular tiger was rescued, and it was in a, in a, in a sanctuary up in Dallas. So they actually drove this tiger all the way from Dallas, four hours down, arrived at our place, hit the headache bar, uh, broke our <laughs> sign. Jeez. And uh, What was a closed trailer ended up being an open, like, convertible trailer. I feel like the real story <laughs> is we should get the guy who drove the tiger uh, across. That sounds like... You should have had him on the road. <laughs> that yeah. sounds ridiculous. So they pull up, you see the tiger, uh, you've got all your procedures ready to go. Uh, there's a great part in the show where you guys are just kind of clearing paths because the challenge here is that you have to, the, the tiger can't stay there for recovery, right? The tiger has to. That's correct. He, right. he went out the same night. Went out the same night. Yes. It's remarkable. Um, so I don't want to give too much away from the episode because it is, um, it's, it's really well done and put together. But there is a, a fascinating moment, I think, towards the end that you share with the tiger, uh, just sort of like in the, in the final. If you could talk about, because I'm sure it's not the first animal that, but that moment where your eyes kind of connect and, and what that felt like in, in that moment. Uh, if we can, you know, uh, elaborate on what happened there, totally fine, but I'm trying to preserve some of the suspense for our guests here. <laughs> sure, you know, big cats don't always do um, well under anesthesia. And we had some concerns while she was down um, yeah. for surgery, you know, her stats weren't exactly like we wanted them to be, and, and those weren't getting better um, immediately. And so during her recovery, we were really concerned. Um, so the moment that she was, was cognitive um, and aware that I was there in front of her was, you know, then it was that huge sigh, sigh of relief. relief. And, yeah. and yeah, then it became very gratifying, you know, because she, she was okay. Yeah. Once she was really angry to see me, I was happy. <laughs> so. uh, absolutely, it's it's incredible stuff watching it. Uh, the the scope of what you guys do in just the first episode, if it's any indication uh, of what to expect, I mean, it's it's really something special. That's, that's only the beginning. Yeah, yeah, I can't even imagine. Yeah. Uh, we're gonna do some other fun stuff uh, pertaining to the show, but Animal ER. It's this weekend, ten o'clock, Nat Geo Wild. Correct? Yeah. Correct. Cool. Yeah. Uh, so I want to move on because in your profession. You guys uh, encounter all sorts of interesting uh, things, I'm sure. Uh, animals, pets, uh, all varieties, uh, swallow various objects and, and things of that nature. So uh, when we were planning this, I was like, oh, it'd be really fun to, to talk about some of those stories. And then you guys delivered, and we've got some of the x-rays. And then you can a step further. We even have some of the animals here. So we're going to play a fun game uh, where we're going to take a look at an x-ray. I'm going to see if you guys can guess what's in there. We'll bring the animal on out as well, uh, and we're going to have a little bit of fun. I wish I had a funny title for this, uh, but I don't. So those watching at home, feel free to tweet us one at Build Series NYC. Come up with a title for this game. Use an emoji or something. Go nuts. I don't know. Uh, but we're going to start. Uh, if we can get the first x ray up here, we'll have a little fun with this. Now, right off the bat, <laughs> yeah, right. We were going to say, Dr. Brian, you had oh, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, this is something we see all the time. All the time. Yes. Um, who can guess the animal? Go ahead, just shout it out. We're not throwing mics out for this. <laughs> who, said, who said cat? <laughs> <laughs> What's your cat look like? <laughs> You need to feed your cat. I'm going to tell you right now. So, Flash turtle. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, and if you guys can see in the middle, uh, my guess was uh, uh, some kind of a, a Christmas hook or something like that. Anybody got an idea what's going on in there? Anybody? Paperclip. Paper clip. I got paper clip. Anybody? Yeah. Fish hook. What do you think? What, what, what's happening here? So there's actually two fish hooks. Um, and, and that's something that we see, you know, a lot more often than we would like to. Here we have a little turtle here. Oh, look at our little buddy. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, this is actually, this is a diamondback terrapin. Um, these guys are native to um, like the marshlands, the brackish water. You'll find them all the way from New England and they, they sort of sweep down around the Gulf all the way into Texas. Um, so, you know, these guys, they are kept as pets fairly routinely. You'll see them in the pet trade. Um, but if you're, if you're lucky, you'll also see them in the wild. But these guys, because, um, you know, because of their, their native habitat, which they share with a lot of fish that are commercially fished or recreationally right, right. fished. Um, they're, they're scavengers and they're, they're predators, so they wind up ingesting fish hooks just like fish do. Um, and so we see these cases with wildlife. You know, we have a lot of turtles that come in um, that have, that good Samaritans pick up, that they see that monofilament fishing line hanging out of their mouth Got or they're it. bleeding. Um, and so, you know, we, we can go in usually and retrieve them with a scope um, in, in the best cases. And we also see it, um, unfortunately, 
there are turtles that are brought into the pet trade this way. Um, you know, it can still be a bit of a seedy business and, and people actually catch them with fish hooks and then yeah. sell them into the pet trade. And so they come in from, you know, Central and South America, Southeast Asia with fish hooks from, from when they were actually collected. That's kind of terrible. Yes. Um, well, my question, uh, follow up, you're saying they're scavengers. As a pet, is it, it, they're, they're not typically something you have to worry about. A lot of people were guessing paper clips. Is that something, do you guys see a lot of that? Or is it mostly when it comes to a turtle swallowing something, nine times out of 10, this is what we're looking at, right? You know, I, I think that that's the most, the common. most common yeah. thing that we see. But um, with a lot of pet turtles, the, the culprit tends to be uh, rocks. Gotcha. They eat a lot of gravel and rocks and things that they sort of, <laughs> find around their aquarium or... How do you prevent that from happening? Uh, no rocks. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Yes. Uh, I should have seen that coming. Mile yes. away. <laughs> um, yeah. Yes. Uh, boy or girl turtle? So this is actually a little male. Um, the, the males are, are smaller and, close your turtle ears, a little less impressive than the females. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> the, the ladies tend to have these like to big voluptuous, uh, they look like lips, it's actually their beak. They eat a lot of crustaceans, um, so they've got these big like powerful crushing um, beaks that the, the ladies just have giant faces. They're, they're really, really cool. And unfortunately, that crab eating habit um, leads us to find a lot of them dead in, in crab traps and things too. Gotcha. So participate in, in like crab trap cleanups and uh, beach cleanups. It's good for these guys. Final question. Uh, everything I've learned in my life about turtles suggests that when they're scared or even a little bit uh, terrified that they would duck into their shell. This guy either loves what's happening right now or I was lied to my whole life. So uh, like, what's, what's the deal with the head into the shell thing? Is that so sort of, a reason? Sort of the latter. You may have been lied to a little bit. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, there, there, there's very few empirical statements about, mm -hmm. about any of these species. Um, the aquatic turtles there, which is this, the category that this one falls into, they try to just sort of dive or run away. Gotcha. Um, you know, he, ideally there would be water, he would splash right, in, right, and we right, wouldn't right. ever see him again. Tortoises pull into their shells a lot, so Got you'll it. see that if you harass a tortoise. Fair <laughs> and do we know, does this little dude have a name? I don't know if this little dude has a name. Do we have a name? INTY. I Guys, round of applause for NT right now. Yeah? <laughs> Good job, NT. <laughs> there we go. All right, well, boys, what we got next on the screen? Let's see. Let's throw it up. All right, first, this is a fun one. Yeah, yeah, what is going on here? So, uh, can anyone guess the animal? Alligator. <laughs> Somebody say, no, it's not an alligator. Then what, what do we think? What are you? So, nobody, what, what, what kind of animal are we looking at? Uh, it flies. There we are. It's not a bat. How many flying turtles have <laughs> it you guys could be a seen? Flying. She got a bird. She, yes, it's a bird. It's a bird. a bird. I'll take it. So Half a point. This was a cockatoo. Um, this was cockatoo versus, am I supposed to give away what, what's in there? Well, actually, I, I was going to have people guess, but I have no idea if we're ever going to get this one. I could not catch what this one was, and I feel like we're just going to... So you can go ahead and tell us what this is. A zipper. This so is this, this is a dismantled zipper inside of a bird's GI tract. I just, uh, I may have overheard that he's very nervous. Did I suggest no applauding for this one? Yeah, that'd probably keep him calmer. Okay, um, we're all gonna chill out right now with this bird, because sure. he's very close to our faces. So, this, this is actually a blue and gold macaw. Um, and these guys you'll find, um, well you'll find them, they're, you know, they've inundated the pet trade. They're, they're captively bred um, these days, so he, you know, was never a wild animal, um, but, in the wild, you'll find them in northern South America and, and central South America. Hey, bud. Um, and, you know, these guys have a super long lifespan. People do keep them a lot as pets. Um, but when you're talking an animal that lives 50, 60 years, you've got to have a good long-term plan. And so, um, you know, what happens is, unfortunately, people don't realize what they're getting into. Um, and, you know, they wind up going household to household to household, which is not really good for such an intelligent anything, animal. An animal. Yeah. yeah. Um, but these guys do, um, unfortunately, come to us a lot with foreign bodies. They, they're foragers, and, you know, naturally they chew on a lot of things. So yeah. whether that's them, you know, chewing their way through your house or your jewelry collection or your clothing, um, we see them a lot for that reason. And, and the animal in this picture, this cockatoo, actually presented um, for heavy metal toxicity, not like 
not like Metallica heavy metal, but like... <laughs> right, right. <laughs> right. Um, zinc toxicity. And um, it was vomiting and lethargic. Mm. And its parents knew something was wrong. So they brought him in. And we were able to fish that out. And, and he made a full recovery. I was going to ask, how do you get something out like yes. that? So yeah, you... A tiny little scope. Try to, whenever possible, not be invasive. Yes, right? and just, yeah. yeah. For sure, for sure. All right, cool. Well, let's all think about how great this bird is. And we'll uh, applaud in our minds. We'll go ahead and trade him off. Uh... Fantastic. I've got another one up there. What do we got next? Let's throw it up. Let me see. What are we looking at? All right. Now, this one, actually, I don't even know if I could have you guess, because this one's really tiny. Uh, in fact, I only know where it is because it was pointed out to me earlier. This one, um, and our next little buddy that we've got up here. Oh, you can start awing from now, because it's an adorable rabbit. Look at this. Bring him. Oh, look at his little cheeks. Oh, my God. <laughs> so this is a rabbit, right? Or bunny rabbit? I'm not a... A bunny, rabbit, a, sure. bunny rabbit. a bunny rabbit. A bunny rabbit. I mean, that's a, a window into name. the scope of my knowledge here. Um, and uh, what, 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 did, uh, was this the, what did this little guy get into here? So if you see um, where the R is on the, the right side of the abdomen there, yeah. there's a little um, bright <laughs> piece of Yeah, that sliver metal, right? right there. So um, that was actually an incidental finding. It's a nail uh, that oh. this rabbit decided to eat, not this rabbit. But no. a rabbit decided to eat. Um, and we actually just found it on routine radiographs. So it wasn't something that we were actually looking for. It was just an incidental finding. So was it uh, a matter of the, the, it was so tiny or so incident that it wasn't even affecting the end? You have to remove it at that point, right? Or no? Is no, it actually, actually, since there was, you know, there was no, no benefit in our minds, um, you know, sort of that. Right, that right. Out, you know, see what way, the, way the, the cost to, to uh, benefit and... In this case, since there were no clinical signs and the animal was living a completely normal life, we decided abdominal surgery was probably not in his best interest. And, and a lot of foreign bodies will pass, but you need to talk to your veterinarian about it because you can't assume they're going to pass. Right. So your veterinarian is your best source to, to know if, if this needs to be removed or if it will go through all the way to the other end. Sound advice. Uh, we've got one more uh, that we're going to take a look at. Uh, a few more x-rays, but one more guest that we're going to bring up. Uh, before we go any further, uh, Dr. Beal, I must suggest, if you don't already own an oil painting of you holding that <laughs> rabbit, uh, may I suggest that be the exact thing you do upon leaving here? Well, you you notice what she let me hold. She wouldn't let me hold the bird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, because that is fantastic. Okay, so uh, we've got one more uh, animal representative. And uh, would you like to do the introduction for this one, Dr. Beal? Okay. Uh, this is actually my personal pet. And uh, this, is, this is Maisie, and this is my wife, Mary, bringing Maisie up. So Maisie here, again, is serving as representative for all dogs. We're going to take a look at some dog x-rays, and we're going to take a look at some items. So guys, go ahead, throw the first one up there for us. Okay. <laughs> this guy got a little overzealous. Uh, so, uh, is it, shout it out, guys. Shout it out. Nope. Oh. <laughs> Obviously. Wait, wait, wait. What was on the spoon? Good, yeah, good follow-up. Good follow-up. What was on the spoon that caused this? You guys are good at this. You guys are really good at <laughs> How Shout about out to the, the, the audience member who's insistent that it was dog food, which means you were insistent that the, uh, Maisie or the dog in question was eating with a spoon, <laughs> which I, do, I just love that image. Uh, thank you for that. But, who said uh, peanut butter? Yeah, it was peanut, peanut butter. butter? Peanut is butter. Is your dog? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now, is that, is that something, uh, obviously it happens, but I never would have in a million years thought that my dog would pull the spoon out of my hand. Obviously it was by accident, right? Or yeah. what was the story behind this? Or well, we you know, things, you know, dogs are notorious for jumping up on countertops and tables. And this one had peanut butter just sitting on it. And the dog jumped up and said, ah, oh, this looks good. And <sighs> down it went. My and God. it only takes a second. So... Yes. But this has a good ending. We actually were able to remove this with an endoscope. So we didn't have to go in surgically. We could just stick a scope down there and pull it out, out through the mouth. Wow, that is incredible. Just like it went in. Yeah, yeah. wow. Uh, it's, that's a cool one. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at the next one. This next one, when I first saw it. Now, look at that. Okay. Yeah. This is scary stuff. So yeah. we'll go on and guess. Go on. You know the rules. It's a knife. Yeah, you don't. Have, it's yeah. already out. I imagine, right? Yeah, so don't we, be afraid. No, it yeah. has a happy ending, right? We so. gave you two softballs. Okay? <laughs> exactly. Okay. The next one's not going to be a softball. Not at all. But uh, you know, tell same, me the story on this. Yeah, one. same thing. I mean, you'd think that something like that would penetrate the 
the intestines and come out and cause all sorts of problems, and it can. But fortunately in this dog, this was a puppy, and puppies tend to be notorious just like little children eating all sorts of things that they can stick in their mouth. And, and this one had undoubtedly some steak sauce still on it, and oh. the puppy swallowed it. And uh, fortunately, good outcome again. You know, fortunately, the owner saw the puppy eat it. We were able to get the knife out quickly using the endoscope again. Uh, that is remarkable. Uh, something like that, you, you wonder, like, how did, the, how did they even travel with the animal, right? Like, to, to do something. But so cool. So happy it has a happy ending. Uh, next one, let's throw it up on the board. What are we looking at? It's the, 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 the fork next. No, no, we, no. <laughs> we don't have the fork. Okay. This one, uh, again, I know, uh, I'm cheating, I can't guess because I know all the answers, but this one I'm fascinated by. Uh, and I will give you a hint. It is the last thing you would expect a dog to eat. Yeah. And I got another hint if they don't get it. Yeah, that's, that's not a really good hint. That was a terrible hint, actually. If you want to give them what? another one. <laughs> this dog Sword. has a cat in the household. So the, the foreign body goes from one side of the, the all the way across the other just so you know it's not just that little thing she's got it i think you've got it a cat toy yeah it's a yes. cat toy <laughs> this dog ate a cat toy so yeah. aside from being embarrassed in front of all of his dog friends what else can you tell us about the dog that ate well, the cat toy well unfortunately this cat toy went a little too far down the intestinal tract oh, no. and you can see all the the black in there the gas and so this was causing an obstruction of the intestines. So this is life-threatening. So we went in and, and removed this cat toy surgically. And this is the type of, of case you're going to see on Animal Emergency on Nat Geo Wild. So uh, it, it's, it's, we see a lot of these crazy cases of, uh, ca you know, cases that a lot of times wouldn't make it in the past, but now we're able to save many of these animals. In this particular case, I remember the owners didn't realize that this had happened, right? Yes, Until that's true. it was poking out. They were like, wait, has, has she always had a, a toy poking out of her side yeah. like that? Did we buy her like yeah. that? Did yeah. We, no. Exactly. Yeah, is that supposed to be there? Right. <laughs> I, I, I guess the uh, greatest piece of advice there to any uh, dog or pet owner is to resist the urge to do anything about it yourself, right? Immediately, yeah. anything foreign like that, get to a professional, get to a doctor, get, yeah, get it taken absolutely. care of. Yeah, Cool. All right, we've got one more for you. It's a slam dunk. Let's go ahead and throw it up there. Okay. Okay. You see the obstruction? What do we think? <laughs> what do we think? <laughs> right out of the gate. Now, what if I told you? that that very animal was in this room right now. <laughs> Actually, that, that ring is in this room right <laughs> I now. I know. It's pretty amazing. <laughs> so you got to tell us the story. How, what what uh, happened is... Well, oh. <laughs> it, it was, it was uh, actually kind of funny in the end. Um, I was actually out of town lecturing. I do a lot of teaching. And I was lecturing, and my wife called me and said, I got some bad news. I can't find my ring and I think Maisie ate it. I'm like, what? And she goes, yeah, I was washing my hand. I took it off to wash my hand, and I knocked it on the floor, and Maisie ran by, and then next thing I know, she ran off throughout the house, and I, I followed her, but I couldn't find the ring. And she looked very guilty, my wife said. And I said, <laughs> I, did, I, I, I didn't believe my wife. I said, nah, you lost it, right? And, and no, no, she, I said, well, go get an X-ray. So she went, went and got an X-ray. The next thing I look on my phone, on my text, and there's this picture here. So you were right. And so, anyway, so she swallowed this ring, and it went down so quick, and I tested her in, in the room back in the back, and she wanted to swallow it again. So <laughs> these animals do not learn their lesson. Now, fortunately with Maisie, uh, we were able to get it out with an endoscope. She didn't have to go to surgery. And, uh, she, you know, we had to anesthetize her to get the scope down. Mm -hmm. We grabbed it and pulled it out. So happy ending, happy wife, happy life. Oh, <laughs> it's fantastic. Thank you so much for that. Thank you for these. I think it's uh, just about that time. We're going to go ahead and turn it over, take some questions from the audience. Hey, guys. Thank you for being here. Uh, on average, how long does the surgery take, and what was the longest surgery you've ever performed? Oh, that's, that's a great question. And again, like anything, when you first start out, things are going to take you longer. And so some of the surgeries that used to take me three or four hours now maybe take me an hour. Uh, you know, we have a lot of new technology now, and we do a lot of it with scopes and things. So 
And, and, and the way we fix fractures is minimally invasive. So again, things that took three or four hours, because we're doing a minimally invasive, in some cases take 30 minutes now. I've personally, I think, I think the longest surgery I've been in was like a six to eight hour surgery with, uh, we had to do what's called a plastronotomy on a giant tortoise where we actually cut like a trap door into their bottom shell and we had to go in for a like football sized bladder stone. Um, and we had to sort of cut it apart to get it out even. So that was, that was very arduous. Amazing. Uh, next question. Hi, guys. So you guys perform a lot of surgeries on cats and dogs. Is there a surgery that is common between them? Uh, another great question. Yeah, there are some surgeries that sometimes in one day I do 10 of the same surgery. Now, that, that comes to be a little bit boring, and so I like to have the variety, but the most common surgery in a dog is a tear of a knee ligament called an ACL, and you've probably heard that in people a lot. Well, dogs actually have that occur more frequently than people. Um, in cats, I would say that, you know, probably, um, you know, skin tumors are one of the more common ones. Um, we'll also see foreign bodies like we saw here where they'll eat strings, like those toys that kind of have strings are very dangerous. You have to be very careful with any type of string object around a cat. Uh, next question. Do you ever get false alarms? Like maybe people think that they, the dog ate the ring or, and it, they didn't? Oh, all the time, yes. And, and actually sometimes it's very confusing. Um, people will say their animal ate something and they'll come in and they'll throw the doctor off because they'll just assume that that's the problem when in fact it may be something totally unrelated. And so they could have an infection of the intestinal tract and nothing in there. So occasionally you'll go in surgically to remove something that they thought was eaten, but it's already gone out the back end and this was just you know, an infection that caused the problem. So we see that all the time. We actually see sometimes in... in, uh, in the exotics department will actually see the opposite, where someone won't cop to the fact that their animal ate something. And a lot of those cases are marijuana toxicity cases. <laughs> and, oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, where the animal clearly has ingested marijuana. And if we just need them to come clean, it's, you know, we're not going to take anybody to jail. We just need to know so we can treat your animal. So moral of the story, if it happens, tell us. And how do you know? Well, the because smell they usually. <laughs> no, because, like, because they're eating exhibit, Cheetos. <laughs> do exhibit some classic symptoms, yes. Maisie shows up one of those like orange beards around her face. Like, Maisie. Guys, uh, thank you again so, so much for coming. And congrats on the show. This weekend, Saturday, September 10th, 10 p.m., 9 central, Nat Geo Wild, Animal ER. One more time, everybody. Dr. Brian Beal and Danielle Inman and Maisie. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you. All right, thank you, Matt.